Hi, yo. We're up here in our Tech Nerd headquarters in Ballard, uh, enjoying some of the clear skies. And we happen to be talking about virtualization and, containers. and the relation of virtualization to container technology. Not like hypervisor stuff and all that jazz. But we realized, oh my God, there's a whole bunch of confusion about that. And like some people think that containers are like mini VMs. Which is a bad idea. And they can just substitute VMs with containers to make everything faster, but they're not actually thinking about containers in a right way. Why would you not do this? Just because simply you don't have a, a detailed information on of how containers work, and you just uh, hear about this term because it's popular and trendy. So I just wanted to like bring the light to the virtualization and containers topic. The darkness of trying to put exchange on your container. Don't do it. It's a catastrophically bad idea. Don't take vertically scaled shit and put it on your containers. <laughs> so what do you usually think about when you think about virtualization? Like hardcore virtualization. Holographic images in Star Wars. Seriously. Oh yeah, seriously. <laughs> so well, you think about um, like a some physical server and then you have some host OS and then you have some special thing called hypervisor that basically manages how uh, the resources are spread between guest operating systems so that they all can operate together. Right. So in the full virtualization you can have like two types of uh, hypervisors. One is a uh, physical, like a bare metal hypervisor, and another one is uh, hosted, like a, on top of the OS hypervisor. And of course, it's probably more efficient on an enterprise level to have a physical hypervisor, because then you don't have this overhead of like going through two levels of abstractions to access physical systems resources for these guest OSs. So you're saying like on bare metal? On bare metal, literally. So like the VMware or the... It's the, it's the one that's not really relevant because VMware is the giant behemoth and the thing. Ah, hyper. I didn't even know it was around still. It's still that's around. sarcasm. It's still around. So second type of hypervisors is useful when you're like on your user machine, you want to run a Windows OS based on top of a Linux OS. Then you don't really care about high performance I mean that high perf performance. Then you can use the uh, like uh, Oracle Virtual Box or stuff like this. Or Oracle Oracle Virtual Box. It is a, a hosted hypervisor, so it fits into this category. Anyway, but in this case we have full isolation, so uh, the resources are shared. Like for example, storage is uh, you can reserve the disk space that is used by each virtual machine. Uh, you can overcommit some resources, which might be not very good in terms of errors if uh, all of the VMs use their resources on 100%. Yeah. So you're explaining why containers are not little mini virtual machines. Nobody wants to see your face like this close. So. Kernels are exploding. Virtual machines use different OS kernels. With containers, they share the OS kernel. They're more, li more like processes that uh, you can isolate, that you can uh, provide resources for and uh, limit, restrict uh, resource usage and uh, set up some security uh, configuration. So yes, they're more like services, like processes than like virtual machine. Get it? So to paraphrase, Basically, containers run services in isolation on an operating system. They are not fully dedicated operating systems with their own dedicated and allocated full-on hardware resources. So, no, they're not little virtual machines. They are effectively isolated services, and that's it. Kind of a cheap, inexpensive way to do just that, isolated services. So we also got to talking about how containers actually work. Because obviously, like I just said, and like she just explained, they aren't little virtual machines. They operate in a very different way than virtual machines do. 
So basically, the breakout of how containers work is kind of like... So, as you know already, that containers are more like processes. We can isolate these processes from each other and from the base OS. We can uh, limit and restrict how this uh, process uses resources and we can apply some security on them. So basically, what makes containers containers is uh, namespaces, Linux namespaces, uh, C groups, or uh, if you expand it, it's uh, control groups. And uh, for security, it is uh, SE Linux, which some people can pronounce differently, like C Linux. Do they say that? Who says that? Oh my god. I actually Googled how to pronounce S Linux and there is like a, an email thread with the Linus Torvalds in participation. So what did Linus say? Do we care? You could listen to an MP3 file, how he pronounces it. So namespaces uh, provide isolation of uh, processes and how they share uh, the underlying resources. So as you know, resources can be uh, disk uh, storage, uh, file system, uh, mappings like mount points, uh, network, uh, like IP addresses, ports, you know, all of this. Uh, so basically there are many types of namespaces that you can, uh, you can have uh, to uh, basically make it safe for containers to run in the same environment without conflicting. So you can install uh, some app or service with uh, different types of dependencies and they won't conflict on the same uh, machine. And it's really useful for microservices and stuff like this. Or you can run an application on the same uh, uh, host name and port and it won't conflict. Or you can create, uh, you know, uh, semaphore or message queue with the same name uh, on different containers and it'll be fine. So. If you look into it in detail, there are special types of namespaces like mount for file system and mount points, uh, UTS for domain names and stuff like this, and uh, network for different network device, network controllers, network interface cards, and other stuff so that you can have like a uh, same IP address on different containers. So this is basically things that you can dedicate or allocate in some way to the service that you're running or services that you're running on a particular container. So everything that can provide conflicts uh, is described in namespaces. So it's a mechanism to prevent any type of uh, uh, intersection and conflicts between containers so that they can operate uh, independently and in an isolated way. So then you can run a bunch of isolated services on one machine that share resources that they, they don't particularly know exactly what the resource is, but they're using that through namespaces to do things like communicate on the network or provide domain access or something. Yes, they, they exactly provide isolation. So previously there was, uh, there is still a, a CH root, which just uh, basically you can change uh, what different uh, user thinks root is. Uh, so it's like a mount namespace on steroids. Um, and that's, that's how namespaces work. One of the cool ways in which containers actually operate is the way that resources are broken out with control groups. Yeah, so uh, control groups are also called C groups. And uh, you can do resource management using C groups. Uh, so you can control the CPU, the block uh, I.O., uh, memory, like network bandwidth for different containers. Uh, if, uh, let's say, one container, uh, it's more important than other containers. Yeah. So uh, basically how C group works is you can set up a hierarchy of processes and you can limit uh, resources you can set more resources for one process and like less resources for other processes. Um, so this hierarchy is mapped to the system D uh, tree. Mm -hmm. So basically, C groups they represent a tree, and um, there are three unit types of uh, processes uh, in the tree. So it can be basically services, which uh, 
can help uh, start and stop set of processes easily. There are scopes, which is it, it can be a VM, a container, uh, like a user session, and any externally started process. Uh, and there are also slices. Slices are not actually processes. They're just like a grouping of either services or scopes or like basically processes is like a slice of a hierarchy. And there are some predefined slices already by system D, mm -hmm. like user slice, machine slice, system slice, where different specified processes are already running. Uh, so you have this hierarchy where system D is the parent, and then you have slices, and each slice can be uh, consistent of a service or a scope or like other processes. Makes me want to go get pizza. So you can create uh, transient or persistent uh, C groups. You can create uh, them using the system run command, and you can actually set up limitations on, on some set of processes using the uh, systemctl uh, set property command, which is super simple. And uh, then you will be able to influence the amount of resources you uh, give to one container or another. Uh, and uh, you basically, when you use the systemctl command, you manage so-called uh, subsystems or subcomponents. Uh, they're also called uh, resource controllers. They're saying what exactly you uh, you are managing, like CPU or memory or uh, block I/O. So, if you want, if you don't know by heart, like what type of resource controller you want to uh, schedule, uh, you look it up. It's all in the Linux documentation. Because cool. So you're saying RTFM? Mm -hmm. So namespaces, uh, C groups. And SC Linux are basically core parts of Linux ecosystem. So I like it. And and in all seriousness, the documentation is available out there. It's good, and it's all about RTFM. It's a lot of great reading material. Forgot to say. Yeah, forgot to say. So for Docker containers, mm -hmm. for each container, there is a C group created where you can manage the resources and stuff. So this is how C groups are applied to containers. Cool. One of the other things to help secure containers, because if you've heard any of the media blurbs about container technology and, oh, it's not securable, blah, 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 but actually there's a thing that can handle that pretty well, which is called... So it's called uh, SE Linux, and uh, you can... Uh, make Stands for? Uh, security Enhanced Linux. So you can use it. Uh, to make your containers secure and uh, basically it works like this. Usually in Linux you have uh, some sort of permission system mm -hmm. where you have like a owner and permission set. So SE Linux doesn't work like this. It operates based on labels and it has like a labeling system. You assign uh, labels to processes and you assign labels to file system objects. And uh, so one of the security models that SE Linux uh, provides is a uh, type, uh, I think type enforced uh, security or something like this. And basically only processes with the same label, mm -hmm. s of s same type, can access the resources that it is. Uh, within that. Within, yeah. That yes. So you need to make sure that you have SE Linux uh, in your distro. and. Uh, to check it, you just do get enforce, and if it's zero, it means it's not enabled. You need to set enforce and put it to one to make it enabled. So it can run in a enforce and permissive uh, mode, which uh, is basically it's on, but the enforce mode is uh, more strong. So you basically do this via the command line, right? Yeah, you do this via the command line. Cool. Um, so. In addition to this type enforcement uh, level security, you can have also uh, multi-category security, which means that in addition to these labels that you have, you can also have an additional label identifier. So it's when you have uh, uh, 
a lot of uh, processes of, of same type, but you don't want one instance of that process to access resources that are uh, specified for uh, another instance of the same process. Right. So then you can just uh, label it and then add a label identifier uh, for each unique process instance and then it kind of uh, restricts what uh, files it can access to and like even not not only files but like network sockets yeah. or you know what files it can write and read and stuff. Um, and another type of security is uh, multi-level, which is almost the same like multi-category security, but it kind of extends it and adds a dominance part where labels can uh, have a hierarchy. So one label can be a dominant of another label. So it can have permissions to everything that that label has. So basically I could summarize by all of this stuff is super hierarchical everywhere and everything in text files very linuxy not only text files though yeah yeah but it's very linuxy yeah. very linuxy not very <laughs> windowsy <laughs> if you don't have linux i mean se linux you need to have it because you're not even protected from anything yeah. in your containers so, so if you basically if uh you have some some container mm -hmm. right in your bash uh, rc file and add something there it has permissions to do that then administrator logs in and uh the computer is just blows away the commu computer exactly it just nukes it so just with kaplumi with slinux you will be able to actually limit that yeah. uh there is also a project atomic that helps you create policies for docker containers uh, using slinux cool so if you're doing containers and you're trying to run your own OS to run the containers in, you probably want to use SE Linux. Just saying. I mean, you probably don't want to use something that doesn't have those capabilities or your containers might be wide open. So anyway, that's what our conversation was about. We're going to go eat pizza or Thai food or, you know, one of the billions of things that you can get in Seattle. And it's going to be awesome. Peace. <laughs>